Hello, good morning. My name is Jennifer Bacall, and I am with the Programs Partnership and Outreach for Harris County Public Library. Thank you for joining us today and for taking part in our summer reading program. Please um, remember that you can still sign up. It's not too late to register for summer reading, and you can do that um, on your local website, or you can go into your branch now, and they can help you sign up. And I'm really, really excited to introduce you guys to Harris County Precinct 1's environmental education team. And they're going to introduce you to all sorts of interesting animals and tell you about them. And keep in mind that you can ask questions too. So go ahead and type your questions in on Facebook or YouTube. And at the end of the program, they'll answer any of your questions. Thank you again. And here are our educators for the day. Hi. Hi, guys. My name is Miss Raven, and I am one of the naturalists that's here um, at the Deucen Park location. We also have another location that is at Challenger 7 Memorial Center. And so I'm just what you call a naturalist. So if you've never heard that word before, a naturalist is somebody who likes to study nature. So I like to know all about the trees, the plants, the animals, anything that's outside in the environment, right? So the um, program has been here for around 30 years, which is a pretty long time. And we have lots of different programs available um, that we go around and do for the kids. So we have what's called a traveling naturalist program where we actually go to the schools and we'll present different environmental education programs to the kids along with our live animals. We have our junior naturalist program, which involves some of our after school sites. Um, and we also do different activities with them. We have our polywalk programs, and they are going to be involving our kids that are um, going to be pre-K age. So usually our three to five year olds, um, and we'll present programs with them. We also have what's called service learning. Um, so we usually have um, a group of kids and we kind of monitor them through over months. And so they're able to learn um, different things that they uh, can take with them to different places. We also do field trips and that is where um, y'all can actually come to our site and we'll do different activities. And then lastly, one of the um, programs we have is Discovery Camp, where we have kids to come to us in the summer for a one day camp. Um, we have different activities that we will do outside um, and then they'll get to take home some goodies that we have for them. And so um, when we have those programs, we actually have interns in the summer that work for us. And so you'll actually see some of them today. Um, we have our interns with the CDBG and we also have interns with the LEAD program, which is the um, Leadership and Experience and Employment program. And so today we're going to be giving you a treat and we're going to be talking about smart animals. And so us as humans, we think that we know everything, which we have made lots and lots of advancements, right? Um, but a lot of those things that we have learned, we have actually learned from animals. So you're going to get to see some different animals today, and we're going to take you on a little program and dealing with smart animals. So our first animal that we are going to learn about is going to be Miss Anna with the curly hair tarantula. Hi everyone. So today you have a treat. You have one of my spiders. This is one of my favorite spiders and it is a curly hair tarantula. Let me put it like this so you can see a little bit better. Okay. And what you have in there is going to be the exoskeleton where you just popped it up in there. And that's because they are actually part of a group called invertebrates. That means they have no bone. Then in there, after invertebrates, they're going to be into, call, into a group called arthropods. Those arthropods are animals that have invertebrates that have an exoskeleton. And in there, it's going to have another group that they are going to fall in, and that's going to be arachnids. Okay? 
and that's spiders, right? But it's not just spiders. We have in there, we also have scorpions and some other animals that also invertebrates that belong to the arachnids. Now, uh, as you can see in the picture right there, you see the legs, right? So those ones in there, they actually have jointed legs. So that means they can move, like I move my arm, they can move the same way. Now that are in there, the exoskeleton is from one spider. If you look very close and you can just barely see one that has like a little pin right into the corner over there, that's how big it was when I first got that one. That's when we're that small, they're called spiderling. So they go very fast into their, uh, into their first part of their life. Okay, as you can see, it grows, right? Almost double in size every time they molt. They change their exoskeleton. So this spider right here, okay, this one, okay, is actually from native to Costa Rica and Nicaragua. And they do have, let me see if I can show it to you, they do have what we call spinderets. That means they make silk, not necessarily webs, because tarantulas don't make webs. They do make silk. Let me see if I can pull it out, and you can actually maybe see. I don't know if you can see it or not in the camera, okay? But that's what it is. Now, they have two spinderets. In each one of those spinderets that are right here in the back, okay, you can see it laying down right now in my arm. Those two spinnerets, they have like about, each one of them has about 100 spinning tubes, okay? Now, the silk, when it's inside them, is actually soft. When the protein, and that's the food that they eat, that's what they need the food is actually to make their silk too, right? So when it comes up in contact with the air, it actually hardens, crystallizes, and it makes it pretty hard, okay? And so that's how you see, you know, like you can actually see them is when it gets in contact with the air and crystallize the protein that they actually eat, right? That's part of it. Now, uh, there's some spiders, okay, tarantulas, they actually are terrestrial. That means they live in the ground, okay? And those in there are going to have little burrows. And you have a picture that coming up, and then that one in there, you can see that they have little silk that covers the top of their tunnels, their burrows, okay? And that in there is for two reasons. One of them is actually for protection. So anybody that tries to come in, they can feel that. And I'm going to talk a little bit later how they do that. But also to fill it up and catch their prey. Okay? Now, there are some spiders that are actually going to be tarantulas. They actually are boreal. That means they live up in the trees. But they still don't make uh, webs. What they do is they make like a little funnel. And then they go inside. And they go in and there for protection. So they don't use the burrows. They actually make a little funnel pipe, like a little tunnel that's attached to the trunk of the tree, and that in there is how they actually protect themselves, okay? Now, these spiders are actually nocturnal, okay? That means they come up at night. And they are opportunistic. They are ambush predators, because they're all predators, okay? because they actually pretty much are going to be eating out animals. But sometimes, depending if they're small one, maybe they're like this big, or even like this big, they also prey for larger animals. So other animals like to eat them too, okay? So, but they in here, they're nocturnal, so they come up at night, and that's how they actually go around their burrows, or in the, what, the funnel that I told you about, right? And they're going to try to find out if there has any predators around, okay, or if they have any prey that they can eat. Now, females like this one, or this may be a male, I really don't know because I actually haven't checked it to see which one it is. They can live in captivity about 20 years. The male, on the other hand, has a very short life, only about five years. That's it, okay? So that's quite a bit of difference, right? 20 years to five years. Now, they also can lay quite a bit of eggs, and that's how they keep getting their species, okay, uh, going, right? So they can lay up to about 300 to 500 eggs in one, one time. That's a lot of eggs, right? And from those, between seven to eight weeks, so that's maybe two months, right? They are going to hatch, and they're going to stay around 
until they get basically one to two weeks and they get their first molts because they molt real fast. What is molting? Is when they came out, come out of the exoskeleton that I showed you earlier, right? So they come out, they actually flip upside down. They put it up and drag the legs up and then raise their body, but it's all upside down. They're like, their back is actually now in the, in the bottom. And then they come out of it. And for them to mold, it takes quite a while. It can take like two days. It can take sometimes longer. It can take shorter. It just depends. Now, after they come out, they're already having an exoskeleton outside. And that was the one I showed you, right? It's like a shell in the outside, really hard armor. But it takes up a quite a little while, too, to actually harden and be like really a hard surface. So it helps them protect themselves, right? Their bodies inside. And that can take it up two days, one day. It really is going to depend what the temperature is around them and also what uh, humidity there is. And so it varies in the light source. It varies in a lot of different things to actually that, that get that exoskeleton really uh, hardening and be like what you saw in the picture, the first one that I showed you, okay? Now, if you look at it, okay, you may think it is hairs, right? Well, I call it hairs, but they're not really hairs. They're called sate, which really is kind of like bristles, okay? And that's what these are over here. Now, as they go older, the hair, I don't know if you can see it, kind of little blonde in parts, right? Can you see it better? Okay. As they grow older, those hairs are actually going to get darker. And it's going to not as blondy as it is right now. Okay. And if you look it up in the legs, okay, they actually have in here, they have more hair in the legs that they have in their bodies. In the next picture that's coming up right now, you're going to see their small nails. And they, each one of these legs right here has two pairs of nails. And that's how they can actually climb up straight up in walls or a tree, right? And go up, and then that's how they can actually go and attach themselves and be able to climb. But you can see in there, it's pretty hairy, right, the legs? Now, what do they use those hairs for, okay? They actually use those to smell, okay? They use to for vibration, so any kind of vibration that comes up, they can actually feel those. Remember how I told you about the silk that they make, right, in their burrows? So any kind of little critter that actually walks there, they can feel that vibration, and then they can actually go hunt or hide from it, okay? So it used to detect their prey, right? That's pretty cool. Now, for protection, let's say a predator is coming after them. What they have in those hairs in there, they actually, some of them are kind of irritating, okay? So they make you itch if those hairs get in the air. They're very, very, very light. So if it floats it up and goes up, and then it can get into your eye, and then it'll like actually kind of like burn up. Now, the only ones, because there's many different kinds of tarantulas, right? The only ones that are going to have the hairs like those are going to be the ones that are from the Americas, the New World. The ones from the Old World, they, they don't have that, okay? So it's a little bit different in those two. So let me put it down. So what they normally do, the ones from America, okay, the Americas, and it goes from all the way up from north to south, they're actually going to raise their back part and they are going to scrape some of the hair from their back and from their legs to actually irritate. They're not very dangerous to us, okay? The ones from the old world are, in the other hand, they don't have those hair, so their venom, because they're all venomous, their venom actually is going to be stronger. And those ones also, because they don't have that added protection, they're also going to be more aggressive. Now, these hairs in here that I showed you, each one of them is barbed. So they have a little pointed up in there, okay? And it goes into the, you know, it goes in and then it actually can irritate. The last thing I'm going to be talking about is their venom. And their venom serves two purposes, okay? One of them is actually to paralyze their prey. The second purpose is actually for them to be actually be able to eat their food. So let's say this cricket, this, this tarantula, it's a cricket. 
okay? It's inject those fangs, okay? That you should be seeing right now, going real close. They're actually going to inject that into it, into whatever they're eating, let's say a cricket. Those are hollow, okay? So that means they're empty, right? The only thing they have in there is actually the venom that gets injected and turns every single thing inside that cricket into a liquid, a mush, okay? And then they have a mouth like a straw and they can just go ahead and just slurp it. Just like we're drinking a milkshake, that's actually how they eat their food, okay? Through their liquid, okay? And they have to have that. So the only way they're able to digest their food is because of their venom. So their venom is not just to paralyze or kill their prey, but actually for them to be able to eat and survive, okay? So now the next person that's going to come up with a different animal, and I'm going to let her introduce herself, it's Miss Kristen. Thank you. Hi guys, my name is Kirsten, and I'm going to be talking about the milk snake with you guys today. So, I know what you're thinking, the milk snake does not drink milk. She actually got her name because uh, farmers used to find her in the barns with cows, and they thought they were drinking milk. But actually, they were slithering around, finding all the rodents and rats and stuff. So, if you guys can see her color, she got red, yellow, and black. So there is another snake that has the same color pattern, actually stripes as well. It is actually called the coral snake. So this snake is non-venomous. The coral snake is actually venomous. So um, the milk snake has a pattern with, um, with red and black. And then that snake right there is going to be black and yellow right next to each other. So there's a little rhyme I want to talk to y'all about. So the rhyme goes, red touches yellow, kills a fellow. Red touches black, is a friend of Jack. So if y'all can see, red touches black. So it's a friend of Jack. The milk snake is going to be non-venomous. If y'all see the picture right there, the coral snake is going to be venomous. Because you see the red, um, I mean the black and the yellow touching each other. So the next thing I want to talk to y'all about, if you heard me in the beginning, I talked about how the snakes would eat um, rats and rodents and stuff like that. Well, I mean, the snake will eat rats and rodents. Uh, she is actually a carnivore. She doesn't eat fruits and vegetables. She only eats meat. So uh, I bet you're wondering how she can get a whole rat in her mouth. She actually has um, cartilage in her jaw. So... Um, she actually can extend both of her jaws, her bottom jaw and her top jaw, as you can see in the picture. And it, the cartilage that she has in her jaw to extend it is almost like a little rubber band. So it stretches out and it goes back um, after she gets her prey. So she'd open her jaw up, the prey would get in, or she would catch her prey inside and then close her jaw and digest it, digest the food. And she has little acids in her belly to help the food digest so it isn't so lumpy in her body. Um, and she does actually have teeth. The coral snake that we talked about earlier actually has two teeth in the front because it is a venomous snake, snake so it's easier to catch the prey. Uh, she does not have little two teeth in the front because she isn't venomous. But she does have teeth inside of her mouth. Um, so do y'all think snakes have bones? they do um, they actually have about 300 to 400 ribs in their body and um, if you could stick out your hand when you're tapping on the table you know how you wiggle your fingers well that's actually how their ribs move so um, stick out your fingers and then tap like you're tapping on the tape and then that's how their ribs slither and help them move across and on the end of her body right here you could see in the picture that they have a little tail Yes, right here, right here. They have a little tail. So um, their whole body isn't a tail, just the little part at the end. So you can actually tell where the tail begins because they have a little flap on their body that they use the bathroom with. So when they need to pee or when they need to poop, um, they lift a little flap up. Let me see if I can show you guys. Y'all can see. Ooh, I apologize, guys. You can see the little flap right here. That's where she lifts it up to use the bathroom. And then when she's done using the bathroom, she closes it back. So, um, and as y'all can see, she's not too long. She's not fully grown yet. Um, so these snakes can get to about three to five feet long. And yeah. 
So um, snakes actually shed. So if you can see her right now, she's actually in blue face, which means she is soon gonna be shedding her skin. So um, yeah, so when she sheds her skin, the skin just falls off. And if y'all can see her face right here in the front, she doesn't have eyelids like us. So you know how we have a top and a bottom? She has no eyelids. She has little scales to cover up her eyes and protect a little bit, but they don't close all the way. So their eyes stay open. Also, if y'all can see her little tongue in the front, she's not trying to lick you. She's not trying to frighten you. She actually sticks out her tongue to sense what's around her. So she has um, a left side and a right side. So if something's on, if she has prey or predators on the right, she's going to sense it to the right. So a prey would be something that she's trying to eat, maybe a little rat. And a predator would be almost like an eagle trying to scoop her up and eat her. Um, so... When she's, when she's sensing it, she actually sticks out her tongue, collects all the particles and everything, and she puts it back in her mouth to the roof. And then there is a little um, organ up there called the Jacobson organ, and it identifies or helps her figure out what's around her, whether it's prey, predators, food, or just something in her environment she wants to figure it out. So um, she is also a reptile. So what that means for her, if y'all can see on her body, she has scaly skin. And then um, when she has eggs, they come out scaly as well. And that's going to be all. Thank you so much. Uh, the next person is going to be Lindsay and Sebastian. They're going to be showing you guys the hedgehog. Hello, my name is Mr. Sebastian. And today I'm going to be showing y'all this one second. The African Pygmy Hedgehog. So these guys actually, they live in South of, no, Africa. Sorry. They live in Africa, as the picture shows you in the range. And they live in the grasslands, in the forest, and they mostly live out in the open. So Y'all might have thought, like when they brought him out, that he was probably a porcupine, and that's off. They often get confused as that a lot. So actually, hedgehogs are smaller, and porcupines they are much bigger. And uh, a picture that actually pop up in a second showing y'all what a porcupine looks like compared to a hedgehog. So that one is called the northern. Northern hedge porcupine, North American porcupine. And hedgehogs actually, hedgehogs compared to porcupines, hedgehogs can actually release the quills. And porcupines, they actually could shoot out the quills and if they're like threatened or endangered. And another picture of porcupine will probably show up. That one, that one's a Western, a uh, crest, crested Western porcupine. So the quills, they shoot them out if they feel endangered or stuff like that, or like threatened to like ford off enemies, like things trying to eat them. And the quills were, are actually really like, they're like barbed. So that's why they get stuck to the like predators. So a picture would also show up of what they look like, the quills that they shoot out. And they're like, look, y'all can see the bars on it. Uh, that's how those, uh, those spikes actually stick onto the predators. So if you try to pull it out, it'll hurt more and stuff like that. And hedgehogs, they actually come out and look for food at night. So that's nocturnal. So that's where they go out and look for food and stuff like that. And they hunt and they live out in the open. So they don't, and they also go out at night. So they won't, since they're really small, it's like a really small animal. So there's not much at night. So it could sneak around faster. And also these guys are op, op, to, to, opportunist omnivores. What that means is they basically could, they just eat whatever they could find. So they eat uh, vegetables, plants, seeds, 
and they also eat small insects or any other thing that could really fit in the mouth. And that's what they eat. Cool. So, do you think these guys actually, when they come out, they're born with all these spikes? So actually, when they're born, they have these really soft spikes that they're born with and that aren't actually sharp. And it's actually kind of like a uh, like a jelly sort of thing, like wa water, like liquid that surrounds them. And as they grow older, they were, their spikes would pop out more and become spiky uh, as, it, as an adult. So another a cool thing that these guys do is uh, a behavior of theirs is if they find a new smell, they will actually lick themselves and like rub it off, like, and they would start foaming at the mouth. And that's, they just start rubbing it all over their faces and start scrubbing it. I don't really know why they do that. We don't really know why. And so that's what they do. And also when they're threatened, when they're relaxed, actually, my bad, they, their squirrels aren't that really that sharp. Their quills, they like point them backwards, so, and they're all pointing in the same direction. But whenever they feel threatened or scared, they actually tense up their back and stomach muscles and roll into a ball. And they shoot out those spikes and start to twitch to like point out and like poke at the predators or anything that is scared of. Because I don't think anybody would want, want a mouthful of spikes. So these guys actually hibernate. Hmm? Oh. So these uh these guys hibernate during the winter or whenever they like other animals do in like the time of day. They hibernate for a couple months and then they come back during the springtime. And that is all I have to say for today. And then I'll pass it on to Miss Chelsea, who will teach y'all about that animal. Hello, good morning, everyone. My name is Miss Chelsea, and today I'm going to be talking to you guys about the hermit crab. So this is a hermit crab, if you guys can see him well. Hermit crabs are what we call invertebrates. An invertebrate means that they have what we call an exoskeleton. So just like humans, how we have our skeleton on the inside of our body, hermit crabs have what we call an exoskeleton that actually protects their body that's soft on the inside. So that we, so we know that um, hermit crabs are a part of many different groups. It has no bones in its body, which is why the exoskeleton is needed. So we know that it's a part of the invertebrate group. We know that it has an exoskeleton. But if you've also are used to eating things like crabs and crawfish, they are all crustaceans. So crustaceans usually live in the ocean or they have like claw-like pinchers like the hermit crab. Another interesting fact about the hermit crab, it belongs to a group called the arthropods. Arthropods allow um, animals like this to have segmented bodies. So you see all of its 10 legs and two claws. These lines right here are what separate the joints of each, of each leg and each claw. So that's what a segmented body means, and that's what classifies it as an arthropod. All arthropods are um, invertebrates. All of them have an exoskeleton, and, all of, and most of them can be found under crustaceans. Not only is it a crustacean, it is also nocturnal. Nocturnal means it likes to move around and do things at night when all these other predators or animals that like to mess with them are asleep and save and conserve his energy during the day so he has enough um, time to move around during the night. Do you see his pinchers here at the front of his body, how there's one big one and one small one? So they're very important for him because these are how he protects himself against predators or animals that try to mess with him. So when he's protecting himself, he likes to curl himself up into a ball 
and go inside his shell because he's able to do that. And he uses the bigger claw to finish and cover up the rest of the shell, the rest of the opening of the shell, while it's still able to pinch and scare off its predators. He also uses his pinchers to catch prey that may be near him. So there are actually over 800 species of hermit crabs, but they are separated into two groups. There are marine hermit crabs and land hermit crabs. What I have here is a land hermit crab. The marine hermit crabs live in the ocean and they usually eat small things like fish and algae or the plants that are around them. This land hermit crab lives in sandy areas somewhere near water and it'll usually eat small worms in the plants that are around it. So we know that it likes to go inside a shell as it's doing now and protect itself. So that means that this shell is actually very important for the hermit crab. Since it is very important, how do you, do you think that the shell is supposed to grow with the hermit crab? It is very important and needed for the survival. However, it does not grow with the hermit crab. So when the hermit crab is ready to molt and grow, it actually has to find a new shell in a new house to live in to accommodate the new body. So how do you guys think they find their new shell? Well, they actually, do, hermit crabs actually do this thing called a vacancy chain. Well, this hermit crab and his other hermit crab buddies will get together in a chain or a cluster, all depending on size with different sizes, and they'll line up or they'll gather up uh, by size and they will switch off shells. So the smaller hermit crab will move on to the medium sized hermit crab shell, and the medium sized hermit crab shell will move on to the larger sized hermit crab shell. And so that's how they work together to find new homes and continue living within their natural habitat. So we learned about marine versus land hermit crabs. They are different. They are different. However, all hermit crabs have gills. Gills are needed to separate the oxygen from within water. So since all hermit crabs have gills, all of them need water to survive. The marine hermit crabs separate oxygen from the water that surrounds them since they live in the ocean. However, the land hermit crabs like I have here use their gills to separate the oxygen from the water that surrounds them in the air. This is called humidity. So if you've ever walked outside and saw that the grass was wet, or if you and your parents have ever driven through fog and see, noticed that the car has been wet without it ever been raining, that is called humidity and that is what helps the uh, hermit crabs survive. If you see the if you see the eyes, if he comes back out, if you see the eyes, he has two eyes on the top of his head. They look just like our, they almost look just like ours, and they're called simple eyes. So simple eyes mean that I can only see one of you and you guys can only see one of me. And these simple eyes actually help him move around at night. See how he's coming out? He's also using his antennas to help him hear and smell. He actually has two sets of antennas. The longer set helps him feel things like we use our hands, and the shorter set helps him taste things. That's it. Okay. He is an omnivore, so that means he'll be eating the plants around him and the animals around him. They eat both meat and plants. And I'm going to wrap it up for you guys with the hermit crab. Next, I'll be introducing Miss Christina with the Amazon parrot. Hey everybody, Miss Christina here, and I have a beautiful friend with me. Just as Miss Chelsea said, this is a yellow-headed Amazon parrot. Um, she might talk for you today. She's kind of being a little shy right now, but we'll give her time to warm up. Um, but to give you a little background information about this species of bird, um, they are found down in Central and South America. Um, find, found for, she likes to talk when I talk. So she'll be quiet until I start okay. talking. Um, they're found in mangrove forests and okay. savannas, okay. swamps, coastal okay. scrublands, okay. agricultural lands. They can be found in multiple okay. different okay. habitats. Okay. <laughs> they are diurnal birds, so they like to forage during the daytime. It's when they're most active. 
Um, and they are herbivorous birds. Like many, many parrots, they eat primarily fruits, nuts, and grains. Um, now, these birds live in very large flocks in the in the habitats that they, they're found, sometimes flocks as large as 100 birds. In these flocks, they um, will find a mate. And so they will actually spend their entire lives with one mate, okay? So they're considered monogamous, okay? Yeah, she's, she's gonna be entertaining to say the least. Um, when they find their mate, they will build nests inside of the hollows of trees. So they are what we call cavity nesters. Um, they do not dig these cavities out themselves, although they can chew. They can use these very strong beaks to chew. Um, but they are not going to necessarily dig those cavities out themselves. They will find empty hollows that were made by other animals, and they will utilize those um, to build a nest inside of that. When they lay their eggs, they lay about two to three eggs at a time. It takes about a month for them to incubate and hatch. And when the babies hatch, they are what we call altricial babies, which means that they are blind when they're born. Their eyes are closed. They do not have feathers. Um, like this little picture, those are not newborn babies. Um, but you can see that they, these that are in the picture that they are actually getting their, their adult feathers in. Okay, And so it takes some time for them, takes several months for them um, to get their adult feathers in. So mom and dad have to do, uh, provide all the warmth. They have to sit on them and make them warm. And then they also have to provide them with food because these babies are too little to go out on their own. And get food. But after about two to three months, the babies are ready to go and they can do what we call fledging and they take off into the environment with the rest of the flock and they just become part of the bigger family. Now in the wild, <laughs> these birds are endangered, which means, um, there's not a lot of left in the wild. Okay, Molly here, she was actually born in captivity. So she was never taken from the wild. She's actually about, um, we estimate about 40 years old. So she's quite old. Um, we've had her for about 30 years and she was about 10 when we got her. Um, but in the wild, they can live up to 80 years. Parrots are very long lived birds, 80 to 100, depending on the species of parrot. Um, now they are endangered in the wild because of forest or habitat destruction, but also because of the pet trade. People take them and they want to make pets out of them, and that's not a good thing. Um, but good for the good thing for her, she was born in captivity. Now, parents, and today's that we're talking about smart animals. This is why we brought our, the parrot today. Um, birds are incredibly intelligent animals. Okay, animals are intelligent based on the size of their brain compared to the size of their heads. That's why humans are so smart, right? We got really big brains. Yeah, you kind of do too. Uh huh. Um, and so birds are also known for their intelligent. Most birds, um, the ones that are probably the smartest birds are going to be those in the corvid family, which are going to be your crows and your ravens, your magpies. But also um, the cytosine family, which are the parrots and the macaws. Um, many can talk like the parrots and macaws. They are known to be talkers. Um, but for the, like the corvids, their intelligence is a little different. They are smart. They're tool users. They are smart enough to figure out how to use tools and um, process different situations. Okay. She is very chatty. Um, now parrots the ones that can talk, like like Molly here, the Amazon, she can um, learn up to 300 words. That's what Amazons have been um, tracked to understand and repeat. Um, some parrots can learn up to a thousand, like African greys. They're so smart. They can learn up to a thousand words and repeat them. They can repeat songs, sounds. Some birds are really good at just mimicking sounds like baby cries and car horns. Um, she doesn't do that. Molly talks, she mumbles, she tells people's names, she sings songs. Um, I don't know exactly how many words, I've never counted, um, but she's definitely entertaining to say the least. Um, one thing is though, they have great stamina when talking, they can literally talk for hours. Usually we cannot get her to be quiet. Um, so the fact that she's been quiet this whole program until now is amazing. Um, so I'm gonna see if I can get her to just say some fun things for you guys. Um, she may do them, she may not. We'll just give her a try and see what she does. Can you say pretty bird? Molly? Hello. Hello, pretty girl. Molly. Molly. Are you a pretty girl? Hello. Hello. Pretty girl. Pretty girl. There it is. Can you give me a kiss? <laughs> Good girl. Can you, can you sing? Scratch your head. Scratch your head. You want me to scratch your head? 
Can you sing row, row, row your boat? Or Jesus loves me. She does do that one. Say row, row, row your boat. She likes that one. She mixes her songs. Help. Help. Save the bird. Save the bird. Fire. 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 You do it. Row, row your boat. So very, she, she stops. She never finishes. All right, guys. Come in here. Is it pretty girl again? All right, guys. Well, as you can tell, very intelligent. Um, she can be very stubborn. Um, just like humans, we can be stubborn. As, they can be just as stubborn as we are. But she's very friendly um, and very smart bird. Okay. That's all I have for you guys for the Amazon parrot. I believe that Miss Haley will be wrapping us up. So we'll pass the baton over to Miss Haley. Hi guys, Miss Haley here. And thank you, Miss Christina and your lovely bird for that wonderful information. And I hope everyone enjoyed our program today and learning about some of the smart animals that we brought for you guys to check out. And it just shows you that in nature, there are many intelligent things and we can use those things to help us with technology and modern things that we have. Um, for instance, the silk that the tarantula produces, um, people have designed bulletproof vests using the same type of material made out of the silk. And there are also um, robots that are made that are shaped like snakes because it's easier for them to get in and out of maybe a collapsed building after an earthquake. And it would be easier to get a small little snake-like robot versus a larger one on wheels. Um, also with the crab, even the exoskeleton, there are some armor that is designed after them and how they have jointed segments. So in nature all around, there are many smart things that we can use to help us in our everyday lives. And if you guys did enjoy those program or our program today, you can check out some of the monthly Polywog programs that we do at some of the libraries um, at Aldean currently. And in the fall uh, for the north side, uh, we will be doing the Polywogs at the North Channel. And also down at the south side of the precinct, we will be serving the Parker Williams branch. And if you do have any questions from today's program or about anything at all, you can email us. There are a couple of our emails there. Um, you can get in contact with Miss Christina, Miss Anna, myself, or Miss Raven and ask us about any questions you have. And if you'd also like more information, you can check out um, our website, the Harris County Precinct One website, where we have a YouTube channel and we have several very fun educational videos on there that you can go look up. Uh, there it is, okay. So there's our website where you can look at the YouTube channel and check out our videos. And if you still have questions, you can check out your Harris County Library for more information. So I think now we're going to open it up to some questions. Hi guys, um, my first question is, if hedgehogs are from Africa, how did you get yours? Well, hedgehog, that particular hedgehog is from Africa. Hedgehogs do live all over the world, except for right here where we live in North America, but you can own them as pets. And the African pygmy hedgehog is a very common pet. And that is how we acquired it. You can actually get them from pet stores. Okay. Thank you. Uh, this one is for Miss Raven. Um, could you tell? Uh, uh, could you tell about invertebrates versus exoskeletons? Can you clarify that, please? Oops, we can't hear you. There you Sorry. go. 
We have our animals that are invertebrates, right? And if you're invertebrate, that means that you don't have any bones, right? Most of the time, you're going to have an exoskeleton that is on the outside of your body to help protect. But not every animal that is an invertebrate has an exoskeleton, right? So if you can think about if you're going and you're digging in the dirt, where are you going to come? You're going to get some worms, right? And those guys, they don't actually have an exoskeleton that is on the outside of their body. So just depends. Thank you. Um, let me see what other questions we have here. Um, sorry, I didn't have this pulled up. Um, oh, could you tell me a little bit more about hedgehogs? Uh, do they climb? So hedgehogs can climb a little bit. Um, there are some reports of them climbing over fences. I have seen a video of one climbing a little ways up a tree. Mm -hmm. So they can climb a short distance, but it's the coming back down that's a little hard for them since they have uh, short legs and very stout bodies. Oh, uh, yeah, I bet. <laughs> that's a big fall. <laughs> Um, and a question about parrots. Um, how can you tell the difference of a male and a female parrot? This, the species that Miss Christina showed you, you actually can't tell the difference between males and females. With some birds, like some of the native ones we have here, like a cardinal, you can tell the difference. Usually the male is very bright in color and the female is a little duller in color. Um, but with the yellow-headed Amazon, you actually can't tell the difference. You have to keep okay. Oh, thank you. That's interesting. Um, I was going to ask about spiders. Is every spider venomous? So all spiders are going to have some venom, but they are not all the same type and potency, right? Okay. So the curly hair that we have, like if you were to be injected with the venom, it's supposed to be like a bee sting or like a wall sting um, versus if you have ever heard of like a brown recluse or you've heard of the Black Widow, like their venom is pretty strong. Um, so you can look up pictures about like how their venom reacts to them. And sometimes people start to form like different types of holes in their body from the venom breaking down and you can see like their muscles. So yeah, so um, those are definitely going to be the spiders here that you wanna stay away from. Do um, red ants, the little fire ants that bite, do those also have like a kind of venom? Is that why it, it swells up and hurts. Yeah, so different people react differently. Um, mm -hmm. So it just kind of depends on who you are. But yeah, they have something that once they uh, bite you, it, it's not good. It doesn't feel good for your skin, right? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I was just curious if that was like kind of the same thing. Um, talking about things that hurt, I'm wondering about hermit crabs and if it hurts when they pinch you. So I can speak from experience. I have gotten pinched by the hermit crab and it does not feel good. So some people would think that, you know, it's just a tiny little animal, right? What can the pinch do? But I mean, their, their adaptation is good for them, right? They're supposed to use those little pinchers to help protect them and they will. Um, so a pinch, even though it's a tiny animal, it still hurts. Um, also, I was going to ask about the snake. Is that something that we could find all over Texas or would it be in other parts of our country? So, yeah, there are a few different species of milk snakes. We can find some of them here in Texas. I think we have about four species of milk snake here in Texas, but um, we have different ones along the southern coast of the United States and into Mexico. Okay, thank you. Do you know, how many milk snakes do you guys have in your facility? We have, I, I work down at Challenger 7 on the south side, and right now we have one, a Pueblan milk snake. Okay. One on the north. Um, can I ask another hedgehog question? Yep. Do hedgehogs shoot out their spines like a porcupine? They do not. So whenever they're scared, they will just tense up their bodies and it makes their spines stick out kind of jaggedly, but they don't actually release them like the porcupine does. Okay. And how about um, the Amazon parrot? You, you mentioned that it says a lot of words. How many does it have? Has anyone ever tried to count how many words they can say? 
I think on average it's about 300 that they can learn. Um, it does depend on the bird and the owner probably how much they work with them, but they will mimic up, up to 300 words. I've always seen it in films where um, birds will solve a murder or something because they'll <laughs> yeah. the sentence that, that they overheard. Is that yeah. kind of something that actually happens? They repeat something they overhear? They definitely can repeat stuff that they hear. Usually it's something that they hear repeatedly, okay. um, but uh, they, they definitely can mimic what they hear if they pick it up quick enough. Um, thank you. I'm just looking at some more questions here. Um, oh, can hermit crabs hear anything? So hermit crabs do hear, but they hear in a little bit of a different type of way than us. So um, if you were to look at the hermit crab, they actually have little hairs that are on them. And I actually have part of an exoskeleton here, so you might be able to mm. see. All right. Oh, neat. Can you see like the little tiny hairs that's yeah. kind of like so whenever um, they'll use those hairs and they use it to feel the vibration. So like some of our other animals, um, once they their hairs kind of move and they feel that vibration, then they know that they may need to go and find some place to hide if there's a bigger predator that's coming along. Thank you. Uh, another question about hermit crabs we got on Facebook. Someone asked, how do hermit crabs survive winter? So, so a lot of animals, um, sometimes they will dig and mm -hmm. it helps them to stay a little bit warmer. Um, most of the, the animals, like the hermit crabs, they'll be in more of a tropical place. So even for us, like um, whenever we want go into the cages and we start taking care of the animals, we'll take like warm water and we'll mist it all around the cage. So it kind of helps to mimic their habitat. And so they get that humidity, which helps to keep it a little bit warmer. Thank you. Well, I think that is all our questions for today. Thank you so much for teaching us and showing us all these wonderful animals. Really appreciate it. And thank you all viewers for joining us today. And please don't forget that um, you can still register for summer reading. If you uh, watch today's program with us, you can get five points towards your summer reading goals. And next week we have our, our biggest event of the year. It's called Author Rama. We're having big famous authors every day of the week. We have children's author Peter H. Reynolds who wrote Wish and The Dot. We have young adult author David Yoon who has two uh, books out, both of which got great reviews and are selling very well. We have a famous adult author named Carolyn Kepnes who wrote the U series that they created um, a TV show on Netflix with and much, much more. So please check our schedule and mark your calendars and we hope to see you next week. Thank you.